morning. I'm going to warn you. Um, this is going to be an angry rant about working as a guest worker in Vancouver. So if you don't want to hear me ranting about what I hate about Canada, this is not the video for you. Uh, I just got back from Vancouver and um, it's always fun going into Canada. And that's sarcasm if you didn't pick up on that. Canada has to be my least favorite country to go in and out of. It is a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. And it has gotten so bad that we've got about a half a dozen of our very senior engineers, field engineers. These are the folks like myself, where we commission equipment and stuff. And we also do customer service calls and so on. It is such a nightmare to get across that border and to deal with Canada customs that a number of our senior field engineers have blatantly said, I am not going back into that country ever again. And of course, in Vancouver, there's the Vancouver ports. And we've done all their crane systems and stuff, or a lot of their cranes, not all of them, but we do provide services for even their old, really old cranes. And it's gotten so bad that we decided that there's a company up there that's supposed to be really good with automation and drives and so on, that my boss was like, I need you to go up there. I need you to meet up with this company. I want you to meet everyone at this company, talk to them about our control systems and all, gauge their level of ability and whether or not we could start using them instead of using direct employees. Because since they already live in Vancouver, it'll just be easier than trying to get people in and out of there. And I myself hate going up into Canada. Like it's, it's always the same. So I said, okay, I'll do that. We set it up. Um, we'll just call that company Billy Bob's Automation. So I'm supposed to go up to Billy Bob's Automation. I get on a plane. I fly to Reagan International Airport from Appalachia. From Reagan International Airport, I fly to Seattle, Seattle into Vancouver. Now, for me to fly, it is miserable. I'm a very tall guy. I'm a very, very tall guy. I'm not a fat guy. I am very, very tall. When you go into the military, there's a height minimum and there's a height maximum. I am over the height maximum. I had to get a waiver for this. So I'm over six foot five. I don't want to say my, you know, my height or whatever, because frankly, I don't want any weirdos trying to track me down. So in my employment contract, I am the only employee for my employer that has it in their contract that I am to fly business travel or business class seats. And the entire reason is I cannot fit in a coach seat. I can't sit in the back of the plane. It is just impossible for me. My thigh bones are so long that my, my knees will try to go into the back seat by like four inch or the seat in front of me by like four inches. So I have to cock my legs to the side and you can't really cock your legs to the side like that. But even with the business class seats, it's miserable for me to fly because as soon as I get onto that plane, I will not be able to stand upright. I, I'm, I'm constantly hunched over. I hate using the bathroom on, on, on an airplane because simply trying to take a piss, it's like that movie, Uncle Buck. I feel like I'm trying to use a urinal at an elementary school. It sucks. And so naturally I'm in an unnatural position for so long that by the time I get off the plane, I'm walking with a limp, my neck is killing me, my, my arm is killing me, my hip and my back are just killing me. And I'm waiting in line to go to customs. I get up to customs. I give them all my travel documents. And the guy goes, business or pleasure? I said a little bit of both. Um, what's the nature of your business? And I have to be careful what I say, because if I mention anything about giving training, which is not really what I'm doing, I'm simply gauging the level of experience and knowledge that these guys have. 
But if I say training, Canada is the only country I know of on the planet that if I were to give somebody training, I'm required to have a work visa. That way Canada can gouge me and my employer. And I explain that I'm going to a company called Billy Bob's Automation. I'm gonna sit down with these guys through a series of meetings because we're probably gonna start using them as a resource for us. We provide services for the Port of Vancouver. What do they do? Billy Bob's Automation? No, the port. I've, this is the kind of stupid questions that I get asked only by Canadian cust customs. It's a port. It unloads shipping containers. And Billy Bob's Automation, we're gonna use them to work on variable frequency, or variable frequency drives and PLCs. What are those? Well, PLC stands for Programmable Logic Controller, and a variable frequency drive is literally a drive that outputs voltage at variable frequencies to control a motor. What are those used for? They're used to move the cranes. When are your meetings? I'm gonna start at Monday, probably around eight or nine o'clock in the morning, and I'm gonna go till whenever the meeting is done for the day, and I'm doing this from Monday till Friday. Then why are you here? Why am I here? He goes, it's Monday. Your meetings are Monday. Why are you flying here on a Sunday or Saturday? Now, prior he had asked me what my part, my point of departure was. And I took that to mean what was the last domestic point I left to go international? Because that's usually, that's always what the custom people want to know. They want to know where you flew in from your international flight. And they're just checking with your travel information. I said, well, one, I'm not very familiar with the city of Vancouver, even though I've been here a few times. And two, I have to normalize my sleep. There's a four hour time zone change for me. What do you mean? You said you flew out of Seattle. I was like, yes, that was my point of departure like you asked. However, if you're asking me where I started from, I, I started all the way in the Appalachian Mountains on the East Coast of the United States. The guy goes, so you lied to me. I, I, I'm like, I didn't lie to you. I answered your question. Well, you lied to me. You know, it's a, and it's, it's a federal offense or whatever to lie to a customs official. And again, this guy has all my travel documents. And I basically said to him, if you don't want me into your country, just say so right now. I will gladly get on a plane and fly right back to my wife and my son. I don't want to be here. I just don't understand why you're getting here on a Saturday when your meetings start on Monday. Okay. I'm like, okay, what do you want me to say? Well, next time, don't lie. Stomps, or he stamps the passport and he sends me off. I'm like, Jesus, like every time I, I interact with these guys, it's always like I got some dude who thinks he's Jack Bauer from the t stupid TV show 24. I go to get my rental car and I had an incident one time and only in Vancouver has this ever happened where I sat down in the rental car and I felt something like, I thought it was a, like a pen or a pencil in the seat. And it turned out to be a hypodermic needle. Now I was very lucky that the hypodermic needle, what I actually sat on was the plunger. I did not sit on the syringe. Naturally, I was pretty upset. I immediately went to the, um, the, the rental car place and I told them what, they were horrified. They apologized up and down. They upgraded my car. They were, they were apoplectic. They responded to it great. And I really appreciate that. And the whole reason that I am not even mentioning what um, rental car thing is because I really don't want them to get bad press or whatever for this based on how they responded to this. I will tell you this right now. I have worked all over the world. I've worked in Mumbai, India. I have worked in Baltimore, Maryland. I've worked in Gary, Indiana, San Francisco, Portland, um, Seattle, and so on. 
I have never been in a city that has more discarded hypodermic needles than Vancouver. Never have, never have. They are everywhere. The most dangerous job in North America has to be a landscaper in the city of, of Vancouver. It is everywhere. It is everywhere. You have to look at whatever you're going to sit on to make sure that you don't get stabbed in the ass by a dirty needle. It is surreal. And I don't know how the homeless people in Vancouver deal with the weather because it's, it's always cold, wet, and in the wintertime, it does get cold enough to snow a lot. Not as much as the rest of Canada, but pretty good. So I, I do the training. Or I'm sorry, it's not training, but I do the meetings and all. And um, it, it went better than last time. Because the time before that I went into Vancouver, it was when COVID restrictions in Canada were really, really pretty tough. And so I was required to have a copy of my passport, all my vaccine information, and a paper showing that I had gotten a COVID test within, I think, the last 48 hours. And the government told me I needed to have this to be allowed in any restaurant, store, grocery store, and so on. Because for Vancouver residents, you needed to have a phone app that gave that information. And if you did not have that phone app, they were required to refuse services to everybody. My understanding was they were, that the British Columbian officials were even sending out like undercover cops to bust restaurants and stuff for this. And the restaurants were really cagey about this because they were already dealing with the fallout of being closed for so long. But the thing was that it only said on the website that, that I could have this documentation and still be allowed in. In all the press conferences and stuff, and all the stuff that they told the restaurants and the store owners and everything, no, you needed to have that phone app. So it did not matter that I was an international worker. It did not matter that I had all that paperwork. I was basically refused service everywhere. I could not go into a grocery store. I could not go into a restaurant. There were two places that I found that I could eat. One was a 7-Eleven. I could go in and out of there. They never checked me. Now, I'm sure you guys know how there's not a lot of great food in 7-Eleven. And in that 7-Eleven, I was always having to go in between four or five homeless guys that were sleeping in the doorway of that 7-Eleven. The only other place was a, uh, was a um, what are you call them? Uh, um, like a, a noodle shop in, 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 uh, Chinatown, Vancouver. Chinatown, Vancouver has East Hastings Street. East Hastings Street is a place where dreams go to die. Walking down East Hastings is incredibly dangerous. I would argue it's the most dangerous street in all of Canada. And you will see people shooting up um, Fent right in front of you. There are ambulances there all the time dealing with the overdoses and stuff. Uh, it, it's an open-air drug market. It is the most depressing place on the planet. And Chinatown is, is, a, is, is it's, it looks like the worst third-world shithole I've ever been to. And this is in Vancouver. And there was a guy, this Chinese guy, who I don't think spoke a lick of English, who did not, he just let me in and sit there and eat because I would actually pay, and I didn't look like I was going to try to rob him or nothing. He actually treated me decently. He was quite literally the only restaurant owner that did not treat me like I was garbage or who could let me in. I was completely discriminated in Vancouver, in Canada, because I was a foreigner. I've never had this to this extent, the level of discrimination. And again, I'm going to defend some of the, the, the property owners and the restaurants and stuff. Like, what are they supposed to do? Because they could get into so much trouble. They were so gun shy that they didn't care. They were just like, no, I can't let you in. They wouldn't even let me do takeout. Restaurants wouldn't let me do takeout. The hotel I was staying at, I could not eat at the restaurant at the hotel. I couldn't sit at the bar. I couldn't do anything because I didn't have that stupid phone app. 
and the employees of the hotel, which was this was a nice high end hotel, were afraid of getting in trouble with the government. It was absolutely insane. And so on the screen here, I'm seeing some uh, global living ranking index thing. I, I don't understand how anybody fills these things out. Where do they get this information from? I have no idea. Vancouver, you could not pay me enough money to move to Vancouver. The traffic is insane. The housing crisis in Vancouver and Canada in general makes our housing crisis look fine. The cost of housing in, in Silicon Valley, California, is cheap compared to Toronto and Vancouver. Every single engineer that I worked with at this port either had like a three hour drive to work every day or they were still living with the parents. Or it was like three or four engineers with their families all living in a tiny f fucking shoebox of a house all on top of each other. It's insane. It's insane. I don't understand how anybody lives there. And again, you could go to a, a, a freaking zoo and you've got to worry about needles everywhere. I could not imagine having a six-year-old in Vancouver because one of the, you can ask any parent like myself, when your kids are young, they will pick up everything. They will pick up everything. And it's just crazy. East Hastings looks like a third world shithole. You go a half a block over to the waterline, you will see yachts that are so big, they look like they need to have their own crew. I mean, there are yachts that are like the size of a destroyer out on that sound. And it's insane. It's a, and I don't know. It, it is the most dystopian. It, it, it's like something out of the 90s cyberpunk movie. I don't know how people live with this. It's just awful. So at least this time I was actually able to eat in the restaurants. And I and I called up the I, I called up this company and I that Billy Bob's you know automation and I said to them, listen, I'll set this up, I'll come out there, you're gonna pay me. But if I land and you people are still are you doing that phone app thing? Because if you're doing that phone app thing, I find out you're still doing that phone app thing after I get there, I'm getting right back on a plane and I am leaving. I am not staying at all. I don't I could Otherwise, again, all I could do is that noodle shop that's a death trap just to get in and out of there. Because you can't drive your car there. You have to walk. Because if you park your car anywhere in Chinatown, by the time you get back, the car is going to be vandalized, broken into, and there's going to be a sleeping junkie in the back seat. And I'm not going to eat at 7-Eleven. And I'm not going to just eat out of a freaking Tim Hortons, which is a crappier version of Dunkin' Donuts somehow. Like eating out of the drive through and the guy assured me that, no, no, we're not doing this. Uh, you should be able to go wherever you need to go. And so on. I'm like, you better, it better. I'm warning you, it better. And like one of the things that always pisses me off when people talk about this vaccine thing, there are plenty of people that can't take the vaccine. But in my situation, I took the vaccine. I was one of the first people to get vaccinated. Why? Because I have lung damage from the IED explosion. So I have plenty of pre-existing conditions. Um, I was fully vaccinated and it was fully documented and everything. I could not, could not, uh, nope, nope. I wasn't even treated as a second class citizen. I was basically treated like a ghost person. This is what people get so sensitive about this shit. I don't understand how somebody in Vancouver that doesn't have a smartphone, what were they supposed to do? Because again, it's not like, oh, well, if you don't want to get vaccinated, just, just don't go out. That's not an option for people. You still have to get food from a grocery store. <laughs> it's like, and if you're poor, you're not going to be able to afford grocery store delivery. You're just not. So I get done the training, or I get done the meetings. Everything seems to go pretty well. I'm like, I call up my boss. I'm like, yeah, I mean, these guys aren't the best, but they're not the worst. Some of them seem pretty bright. Some of them were just kind of, I, you know, I, I'm like, I, it's not going to go super smoothly, but frankly, it's going to go smoother than trying to get field engineers in and out of this fucking country. I fly back as soon as I land in Seattle, go through customs. This is the difference between U.S. customs and Canadian customs. Guy, big guy, or big guy, not to me, but, you know, taller than average, very serious looking. 
opens up my passport and stuff. He goes, uh, where were you doing in Canada? I was like, I was there for work. But what do you do for a living? I'm like, I'm an engineer. Guy goes, oh, I love trains. I was like, so do I. He stamps my passport, hands it to me, and goes, welcome back to the United States, sir. I say, it is great to be home. Thank you. I have always been greeted, always been greeted. Whenever I fly back to the States, always welcome home kind of thing, which I've always appreciated because I've talked to these guys at Billy Bob's Automation. I explained to them why it was KG coming out here about the customs. Every single one of them had a story where they're, they're trying to fly back from the States because they've done work in the U.S. And they're like, yeah, it's awful flying in and out. You know, our, our customs people are just dickheads. Yep, yep. I think this is the whole reason why we're looking to use you guys because nobody wants to deal with your goddamn customs. I just always laugh when Americans talk to me about how, oh, God, you're up in Canada. I want to move to Canada. You're not going to move to Canada. Oh, but I would if I could. No, you wouldn't. Because it's all the same shit for the most part. Their politics are just as divided and fractured as ours. There's two political parties up there that control everything. There's two political parties down here that control everything. Don't let anyone try to tell you that if there were more political parties, somehow we still wouldn't have a two-party system. Because that's how it works everywhere. UK, it's the same fucking thing. And really, the only difference between the U.S. and Canada is, in the U.S., you'll go bankrupt from a medical, medical emergency. In Canada, you won't. But in Canada, you get paid less, and your cost of living is obscenely higher when it comes to your housing. It's just like, oh, God, I, I just hate going up to Canada. I really, I'd rather fly back to Africa and deal with that shit than, than fly into Canada. And again, I don't know who are these people that re Amsterdam. There's a prime example. Amsterdam is a nightmare to live in. It's an it it is it is like saying that you want to move to Disneyland because it's it's just a massive tourist city. Everything is involved with tourism and stuff. You can't go anywhere. Zunich is boring as shit. Calgary and Vancouver, are, basically Calgary is Vancouver, but with no beautiful waterline and mountains. Um, Frankfurt is boring, boring as shit. Toronto, oh God, it's, it's Vancouver, but with shittier weather. <sighs> Melbourne, oh my God, the cost of living there. <laughs> like, it's, it, 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 these, these city lists are hilarious. It, it's basically what famous cities, that's what it is. Famous cities like New York City. Oh, it's the greatest. It's the greatest city in America to live in. The metro smells like a bathroom. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah. These surveys are just so funny to me because they either they must be filled in by tourists or like super rich people. They're not they're not filled in by the rank and file people like Vancouver. If you if you only speak English and you live in Vancouver, you're bone, you're bone. Because Vancouver now is an Asian country, like or a Asian city, like they totally. You're better off knowing you're better off knowing Cantonese than you are knowing English in Vancouver. And like the government is totally kosher and involved with the shady shit involving Chinese money flooding the housing market and stuff. It's completely unsustainable. It's completely unsustainable. If my employer would let me do it, I guarantee you we could raid Billy Bob's automation company for talent. All we would have to do would be like, this is where we're located in um, Appalachia. This is what a house costs here. And we got a really good medical program or medical benefits compared to most U.S. companies. And I guarantee you these guys would jump at it. Because the, like, the cost of living up in Vancouver is just ridiculous. You'll never own a house. If you are graduating from a college in Canada, unless you're going into engineering and unless you're living in the middle of nowhere and unless you have a job that will allow you to work remotely, you will never own a house in Canada. Don't even try. Don't even think you will because it's never going to happen. Yeah, this, these lists are always so, so amazingly stupid.
Ottawa. Ottawa. Ugh. Montreal has at least got good food. San Francisco. There's another one. You could not pay me to live in San Francisco. Boston. God. Yeah. It's just crazy because, you know, at least in the States, at least in the States, you can move to a small city, get pretty much all the same experience as a big city, and it's just so much cheaper. It's so much cheaper. One of the guys at Billy Bob's Automation started asking me about housing, and I explained to him, like, yeah, my, my house right now, housing prices in the States have gone absolutely insane. My house is now worth like $400,000. And they're like, oh, it must be pretty small. I'm like, no, it's a three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath with a garage, five or four-mile drive to work when I'm working in the office. Uh, I can walk to our downtown bar area. It only takes me about an hour. I've got miles and miles of mountain trails that I could jog, all this great stuff. And, uh, you only, and, I, and I showed it on uh, Zillow. I'm like, yeah, this is where I live. And you paid 400000 for that? I'm like, no, I paid 90000 for it. And that's when the jaw really dropped. And I'm like, well, it's a 110-year-old house. Um, I gutted it. Me and my wife um, basically rebuilt the whole house ourselves from the interior. So I added the, you know, the, ex, the two whip, one and a half bathrooms to it. Um, and I kind of rearranged almost everything inside the house. But we, I'm like, we did it ourselves. So I'm like, so I paid $90,000 for the house. I probably put in about $70,000 worth of material and all, pulling permits and so on, make sure it's legal. I'm like, but yeah, I'm like, I was like, I, I'm like, I got to give my wife all the credit in the world. I'm like, because I travel so much. This took us about three years to actually get done with it I'm like but yeah I paid cash for my house and um, I just had to gut it and update it and uh, now it's worth like four hundred thousand dollars which is kind of unfortunate for me because my tax bill keeps going up constantly and that whole reason is because they moved a university's medical complex into my town or into my city so now that's the largest employer I'm the only person on my street that isn't a doctor now but I mean, at least I had that opportunity. Whereas in Canada, now you're boned. You're boned. Like if you're trying to buy a house in Canada now, if you even suggest to the homeowner that you want a housing inspection done to protect you, that homeowner is going to disregard, disregard your offer. And whatever they put out there in terms of what they want, because I talked to these guys about this, you basically have to offer 20% over that and you need to offer at least 80% cash because you're competing against these Chinese people in China who will overpay remarkably sight unseen all cash because they're trying to get their cash out of China. And so like the one guy was telling me like in his neighborhood where he grew up, he goes, he goes, we got priced out of our neighborhood, but if you go to that neighborhood, all the houses are overgrown. Nobody's living in any of the houses whatsoever because they're all owned by overseas investors. And he goes, they don't even rent out the homes. So for all intents and purposes, this really nice neighborhood only has about 10% occupancy. I'm like, yeah. Canada's all kinds of a fucking mess. So I'm glad to be home. Wife's at uh, work, kids at uh, school. So dad's kind of just rant, relaxing after a run um, and decompressing from my business trip. But God, I hate going up to Canada. I just every single time. It's just, it's never smooth. And it's not just Vancouver. Like I've done jobs in Nova Scotia, Ottawa, um, I have to go up to, what's it called, um, Hamilton, Ontario all the time because there's a bunch of steel mills there. And it's just every time I go in and out of Canada, it's just freaking miserable. But I digress. I'm done ranting for the few people that actually watch this weird stuff. Y'all have a good one.